so I'm going to give a, a general uh, kind of overview talk about some issues in ocean circulation theory and maybe general fluid mechanics and its work which has been done with a variety of uh, postdocs and students at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, Francesco Paparella, Cesar Roca, Navid Constantinou, Tomas Bossi, who is from Ecole Normale Lyon, a graduate student there, and uh, Stephen Llewellyn-Smith. And um, basically, the ocean is in motion, right? <laughs> uh, this is perhaps the largest and longest and highest resolution global ocean circulation ever run. It was done at uh, NASA. And um, what you're looking at is the sea surface speed, that is the square root of u squared plus v squared. And so what do we see here? Here we see the Kuroshio current. You're seeing one frame every six hours or so. And so on those time scales, the Kuroshio is more or less steady. What do you think the flashing stuff is here? What's this rapidly flashing? Yeah. Tides. Did someone say tides? Yes, tides. Uh, the ocean has tides. This is a model that resolves tides. You can also see perhaps, maybe not here, it's kind of boring when you look at the Atlantic. The Atlantic's not a very interesting ocean. Um, let's go. Because you're seeing one from. You're seeing one frame every six hours, and the main tidal period is 12.4 hours. So they're heavily, heavily aliased in this movie. It's, uh, it's almost yes. Yeah, you're not seeing the full resolution of the tides. But one thing you can see, particularly in the Southern Ocean, is these patterns. May, you have to have good eyes, but the patterns which travel very quickly across the surface of the ocean. Uh, you can see that? So that's uh, an atmospheric storm, which is traveling faster than anything in the ocean, across the ocean, and uh, putting the surface layers of the ocean into motion. Okay. <coughs> and now here's a question for the non-oceanographers, because for the oceanographers, well, it's not fun, but for the non-oceanographers, um, <coughs> what are the main mechanisms that uh, force motion? that is the do work on the ocean. So if you think about the movie you just saw, um, uh, okay, uh, the kinetic energy is going to be dissipated somehow by viscosity, by a cascade to small scales, and so there has to be a supply of kinetic energy, agencies which do work on the ocean, as I say, and how many ocean forcing mechanisms uh, can you identify and quantitatively, which are the most important? That is the numerically largest. Anybody care to guess? Non-oceanographers only? Give me one, come on. <laughs> Especially if you went to Powell's talk in the morning. Wind, yeah, wind. Okay. Another one? Tides, Oop, yes, astronomy. Tides, certainly. Another one? Convection, yeah. Uh, actually, convection, there's two types. There's um, surface driven, the fact that the uh, poles are colder than the equator and patterns of precipitation, which create salinity differences. Uh, lateral salinity differences at the surface of the ocean. But the ocean is also heated from the bottom uh, by geothermal heat. Slightly heated at the bottom. You might think it's slight, though, if you work out a Rayleigh number <coughs> for the um, geothermal heating, it's a number like 10 to the 20. So it's not exactly what you would call small Rayleigh number convection. Uh, any more? That's, I'll count that as four. There's a fifth one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the rivers will. So, like, I would actually count that as part of surface convection because when fresh river water goes into the ocean, it creates shallow um, density gradients. So, yeah, rivers, but I think it's rather similar to precipitation, maybe. Sorry? Sorry? 
Heat. Well, geothermal heating, yeah, that's all convection. Yeah. Biomass. Sorry? Biomass. I, I can't hear you. Biomass. Biomass. Yeah, fish. Yes, bi uh, bioturbation. Fish swimming. Okay. Uh, now, which are the biggest? <laughs> In terms of watts, rate of work. Um, I'm hearing a variety of different answers. <laughs> uh, wind stress is the biggest. I've put them in order. Big print means big source. So wind stress, wind stress is the largest. Uh, tides, which is extraction of energy really from the spin of the Earth. The Earth is slowing down. The day is getting slightly longer. And that energy is going into the ocean. Uh, fish is number three. <coughs> Geothermal heating at the ocean at the bottom at the bottom of the ocean is number four, and the weakest is non-uniform heating and cooling at the top of the ocean. This is quite surprising, I think. Yeah. I have a question. The best plankton. Yes, plankton. Uh, no, but, um, well, they provide food for fish. So one of the way this has, one of the ways this estimate is arrived at is by figuring out the total uh, rate at which plankton photosynthesize, which is the amount of energy going into the base of the food chain, and then ecologists work it out by, you know, having a pyramid of things eating plankton. But um, they don't actually directly drive ocean motion in the ocean, whereas a swimming tuna has a wake behind it which is creating turbulent mixing in the wake of the tuna. Now here's a quantitative estimate. Your eyes are going to glaze over if you look at this figure, but I just want to direct your attention to the top five or six panels here. These are the sources of energy. And the numbers here, <coughs> so loony solar tides, 3.5 terawatts going into the ocean. Winds, 20 terawatts, well, 20.6. Uh, heating and cooling, zero. Evaporation and precipitation, zero. Uh, geothermal heating, 0.05 terawatts. Uh, this is actually one which is not on the list here. That's the fact that the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the ocean is not constant. It's changing with position in time. So that's direct pressure driving of the ocean. That's also a small contributor. So. Um, OK, as Wunsch and Ferrari say, all numbers except uh, 3.5 terawatts, that is the, t the tidal driving, are uncertain by at least a factor of 2 uh, or maybe a factor of 10. But of course, some of the numbers are 0, so you can multiply them by 10 and they're still 0. Um, they ignored fish, and I'm not sure why. Uh, a large part of most of today's lecture is going to be about heating and, heating and cooling and why those mechanisms are so weak, why the convection in the ocean uh, provides such a pitifully small amount of mechanical energy to the ocean. And uh, you might ask, why am I bothering you with the zero terms? Uh, it's because I think, they're, I think they're kind of interesting, and it's interesting to understand uh, why they're shown to be zero in this uh, diagram here. Sorry, can I ask you a yeah, sure. Um, melting of sea ice, well, it's probably convection. Yeah, it's creating a horizontal gradients in density at the surface. Though when I say convection, um, what I really have in mind is planetary scale convection because the poles are, say, 25 degrees cooler than the equator. And so there's a, hor there's a, hor there's a buoyancy gradient at the surface, which means there's available potential energy Dense fluid would sink, uh, light fluid would rise. That's turning potential energy into kinetic energy. Uh, the answer is not zero, as these guys have indicated, but it's so pitifully small that they don't even bother with it. Now, the other interesting thing to note is all these fluxes between the energy reservoirs are shown in terawatts. A terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. So to put a terawatt into perspective, it's a number which is actually um, 
convenient when we're usually talking about uh, human uh, en engineering enterprises on a global scale. So um, a French nuclear power plant, and there are about 80 to 90 of them, produces a gigawatt, which is one thousandth of a terawatt. So a terawatt is about a thousand nuclear power plants. Uh, human energy consumption is shown in terawatts. I can't get this thing to work. Uh, from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. Uh, and I'm, I'm really emphasizing the difference between our thermodynamic energy, which is the internal energy of the ocean, uh, which is measured in petawatts, thousands of terawatts. So for instance, the ocean transports 2,000 terawatts, that is uh, two petawatts from equator to pole, that's heat. I'm talking about mechanical energy, the sort of kinetic energy, which is always smaller than the thermodynamic energy by factors of 1,000 in the ocean, okay? Now, so in other words, by most geophysical standards, one terawatt is quite small. Okay, it's big by human standards, or it's a, it's a standard human type number if you're talking about industrial processes. But it's by geophysical standards, uh, it's really kind of small. Now, uh, we can see its importance for oceanography, though, by the following ballpark estimate. You take a terawatt and divide it by the mass of the ocean and you get a number which is about 10 to the minus 9 uh, watts per kilogram. Now 10 to the minus 9 watts per kilogram is the amount of energy you would uh, be seeing in turbulence if you took a hairdryer, which is 1,000 watts, and used that energy to mix up a cubic kilometer of water. A cubic kilometer is 10 to the 12 kilograms. A hairdryer is 1,000. Divide 1,000 by 10 to the 12. You get 10 to the minus 9. So that's the typical dissipation rate in the ocean. That's an observed, measured number. So it's a good number. It's saying that the amount of energy which is going into three-dimensional turbulent dissipation below the surface layer of the ocean, in the bulk of the ocean, is about 10 to the minus 9. And that's why all the numbers in the Ferrari and Munch table are indicated in terawatts. So one terawatt is not much power, and what you should be taking away from this whole thing is, first of all, um, convection is weak and unimportant as an energy source, but mechanical energy itself, even due to the wind, is kind of a scarce resource in the ocean. The, the ocean is not, in fact, very turbulent. Okay? There's not much mechanical energy dissipation. Uh, an epsilon of 10 to the minus 9, when you stir your coffee, you generate an epsilon, that is uh, watts per kilogram in a coffee cup, is bigger by at least a factor of 1,000 and maybe 10 to the fifth than typical ocean turbulence. And this weak supply of mechanical energy to the deep ocean is a very important constraint on large-scale ocean circulation. So in Paola's talk this morning, uh, she emphasized that in the main... Um, uh, part of the ocean, flow is dominantly along buoyancy surfaces. So in the buoyancy plots that she showed where buoyancy was used was, an, was one of the axes, uh, all the flow was in parallel straight lines, conserving buoyancy. That's because there's almost no mechanical energy available to mix the heavy, stable stratification of the ocean. Okay? There's very weak diabatic mixing below the surface all because of this. So let's talk about planetary scale convection. So I'm going to now pass from ocean observations to uh, formulating an idealized model. I'm not quite there yet, but the question I'm going to pose is why does planetary scale uh, ocean convection, driven by the, say the 25 degree uh, pole to equator temperature difference, do almost no work on the ocean? Why does it provide almost no mechanical energy? And this is a consequence of Sandstrom's theorem, and I'm putting quotes around the theorem uh, because it's not really a theorem. It was a set of loose thermodynamic arguments that Sandstrom made uh, in 1906. And one thing that is very easy to do, uh, it's recently been re discovered, is to turn the theorem into a real theorem, quite rigorously, in fact, and show that this is true. And I'll do this by considering HC, that is horizontal convection. 
So um, I'm going to use, well, Powell has already done this, but I just thought it was worthwhile in case this notation is not familiar to you all uh, to mention uh, buoyancy. So I'm going to be using buoyancy B instead of density. It makes the equations a little tidier. So uh, if you're thinking rho naught is a constant, I'm using a Boussinesque approximation. Uh, buoyancy is defined like this. It's the small variable part of the density. If you're in a thermally stratified fluid, this would be the expression uh, for buoyancy in conventional notation. Buoyancy has dimensions of acceleration, and there it is in the momentum equations as a force in the z direction, a vertical force. That's the buoyancy force. Um, these are the rest of the Boussinesque equations, and the, these are the partial differential equations I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk. And here's the horizontal convection problem. Um, it's an idealized mathematical problem, uh, just as Rayleigh Baynard convection is. So we have a container, a uh, three-dimensional box, for instance, and um, only the top, and on the top surface is equal zero. We impose, or uh, we specify uh, the buoyancy as a function of position. So this is a Dirichlet boundary condition, if you like. And on all the other sides of the box, uh, we have no flux, no molecular flux of buoyancy, and of course, no motion through the sides of the box. Uh, U dot n equals zero on all surfaces. And uh, let's see, so here I've plotted some typical buoyancy surfaces, and where heat is entering, the heat enters the box where the surface temperature is warm and leaves the box where the surface temperature is cold. And of course, that means that the flux, the molecular flux, which is kappa dB dz, has to change sign so that it's negative uh, where the heat is going out of the domain. And if you draw the buoyancy surfaces, that means they're static instability, heavy fluid over light, where the heat is going out. So that's convection. That's setting up a statically unstable uh, buoyancy distribution where the surface is cooling. And the key feature uh, of horizontal convection is that all the bounding surfaces, except for the top surface, are insulating. And that's characteristic of the ocean if, for the moment, we ignore uh, geothermal heating, which is a weak source of heat from the bottom. And it's quite different from the atmosphere, uh, which is strongly heated at the bottom and throughout the interior of the atmosphere by absorption of radiation. Okay? So this is a characteristic of the ocean, which makes it very different from the atmosphere. I'm going to show you a movie. This is a numerical solution. H is the depth, the Rayleigh number is 10 to the 8, the Prandtl number, that's the ratio of the viscosity to the, um, to the uh, thermal diffusivity is 1, the aspect ratio is 4, it's 4 times as long as it is high, and we started from rest. There's a very long spin-up. Time is in what I'd call mechanical units. You form a time scale by taking the depth H, and dividing it by a typical amplitude of the buoyancy imposed at the surface. So it's mechanical because it doesn't involve um, molecular parameters like nu and kappa. Okay? In fact, this is the only mechanical time scale you can make uh, in this problem if you're not allowed to use nu and kappa. So the temperature is fixed at the top. Um, eventually, and it takes a very long time, I think this goes to around six or 700, Eventually, you will start to fill up the whole box with the densest fluid at the surface. So the abyss is going to become denser and denser as heavier and heavier fluid is continuously produced. And you fill up the box from the bottom, and it's, I'm just going to get. And of course, as this happens, the circulation slows down because you're creating a situation which is less and less stable. So if I fast forward towards the end of the movie, you can see that the velocities have slowed down. Things aren't churning as fast. Uh, the fluid is a, little, is a bit denser, that is, it's darker blue, and so on and so forth. It just keeps going, and it, even towards the end here, uh, we still haven't reached the final statistically steady state of this, um, of this system. You've really got to integrate for a long, long time to reach statistically steady state. Now, as an aside, and I'll return to this point uh, later in the lecture, uh, what you have seen uh, cannot be described as a turbulent flow uh, by any definition of turbulence that I would accept. Why is that? <laughs> 
Um, I would argue uh, that a defining feature of turbulence is the strong production of vorticity by the three-dimensional process of vortex stretching, and that was a two-dimensional solution of the equations of motion. So the vortex stretching nonlinearity, when we take the curl of the momentum equations, uh, we produce a term like that, which is vortex stretching, production of vorticity. Uh, that's not present in two dimensions. It's identically zero in the two-dimensional case. There's no vortex stretching in 2D, uh, and therefore no turbulence in flat land. Okay? Uh, 2D flow, so 2D flows, like the one you just saw in the movie, they can be unsteady and strongly mixing with many active degrees of freedom, uh, but that's not enough for me to call it turbulent. Yes, and they don't have turbulence, they just have flatulence. <laughs> I was waiting for that comment. <laughs> I think that was Ed Spiegel. <laughs> uh, there's more Ed Spiegel jokes later on. So, um, Okay, so now here's the only rigorous, I think it's rigorous, mathematicians can tell me if they accept this. I'm now going to prove that non-uniform surface buoyancy uh, supplies negligible kinetic energy to the fluid. So the first step is to um, make the following remark. Uh, take your box. There's no buoyancy coming in at the bottom, right? Because there's no uh, conductive, there's no um, diffusion of buoyancy through the bottom and there's no advection of buoyancy through the bottom. So that means that in statistically steady state, if I average over x, y, and t, uh, I have no buoyancy flux through any level z between the bottom and the top. Do you accept that? You can prove it mathematically, of course, by taking the buoyancy equation. Forgive me if this is... Maybe I should use white chalk. Yeah, white chalk's better, I think, isn't it? You can see that. I mean, I'm not going to write a lot of equations. But it's worth convincing you that this argument is... Here I'm doing it just by saying it's physically obvious, but I guess here's the mathematical proof. I take this equation and I integrate it over x and y, and I lose these terms, right? Because I'm going to integrate over x and y, I'm going to get u at the walls and v at the walls, that's all zero. And um, then I perform a time average, I'm saying I'm in statistically steady state, so I lose that term. And then, uh, these terms also integrate to zero because I integrate over y and I get the difference between kappa y at the edges of the box. Well, that's all zero. And so when all the dust settles, if the bar is an xy average, xyt average, then I have that. This is a perfect z derivative. It's d by dz of wb minus kappa b bar z, which is zero. So I know that if, <clears throat> so then I, if I integrate in z, I know that's a constant, but then I go to the bottom of the box where I've, where I've imposed no flux, and uh, that tells me that the constant is zero, and that's the zero flux constraint. At every level z, um, the, uh, diffuse, the diffusive flux of buoyancy is precisely cancelled by the advective flux of buoyancy in the center, okay? Now, uh, that means, and this is going to be important on the next slide, you can probably turn the light off now because it'll be, I don't think I'm going to be using the... Uh, that means that if I um, vertically integrate this, vertically integrate this to get a total volume integral, I've got the total volume time average of WB is equal to the difference, see if I vertically integrate this now, I get the difference between the buoyancy at the top of the box and the buoyancy at the bottom of the box uh, divided by the depth of the box. And now I can use the maximum principle, which would say that this difference, uh, for instance, well, the buoyancy, this is known because the buoyancy at the top is specified, and the buoyancy at the bottom 
has to be greater than the minimum buoyancy prescribed at the top. So you actually know the buoyancy at the bottom as well. And so there's a bound on WB uh, in terms of things which are completely known. B star uh, minus B star uh, is the minimum buoyancy at the top. Okay? So WB is completely bounded uh, in terms of known things. So what's important about WB? It occurs as well when I come to the, uh, when I come to the momentum equation. So I take the momentum equation at the top there and I take u dot the momentum equation and I volume average everything in sight and I arrive at the equation here. This equation is the mechanical power integral. So um, you'll notice I get WB from u dot the buoyancy force. That gives me WB. This is the viscous dissipation and everything on the left hand side of the equation gives me zero when I perform uh, the volume integral. So that's WB is now seen to be actually the conversion from potential to kinetic energy, okay? because it's equal to the rate at which potential energy is dissipated. So WB, or the volume average of WB, uh, is the total net rate at which convection is turning potential energy into kinetic energy. Okay? Yep. But from the zero flux constraint, I have a very strong bound on WB. It's less than kappa B star over H, in fact, it's less than something proportional to the molecular diffusivity of heat. And the molecular diffusivity is very small. So uh, this bound on the kinetic energy supply uh, is very tight and numerically small with ocean relevant numbers. So what I mean is you calculate B star using a buoyancy, using a temperature difference of 25 degrees, pole to equator, um, it's easy to do and I use the molecular diffusivity, 10 to the minus 6 meters per second, um, and I put, in, um, I put in the depth of the ocean, 4 kilometers here, and I get the WB, um, which is equal to the volume average uh, mechanical energy dissipation rate, it is not a hairdryer per cubic kilometer, it's something like an electric toothbrush per cubic kilometer. It's smaller by a factor of at least 1,000 than anything that's observed. So this argument is rough, uh, well, it's rough in a numerical sense, but I think it, I actually do think it's uh, a proof. Um, and it shows that, um, it show, this is why Monk and Munch show uh, zero as being the energy source due to convection. So you wrote from the zero on the end of W, you mean W on the F? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, W and F, there was also another, I, mean, I did get it confused with an earlier paper by uh, Monk and Munch, which was, yeah, yeah, the paper I was talking about first was, um, was um, Ferrari and Munch. And actually, this is the reason I got interested in, in this whole problem, was the first sentence of Monk and Munch is, uh, because of Sandstrom's theorem, um, convection provides no mechanical energy to the ocean. Yes, statistical stationarity. So in the movie version before, I mean, before stationarity, you can see the, the content of the movie. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Uh, that, that, that happens transiently. Right. Yep. So yep. Uh, you have to, yeah, I understand what you're saying. You have to, um, if that's true, and it may actually be true, uh, it's pretty subtle to see how it works. So let me, let me explain why that might be. Um, uh, suppose I add wind forcing to this system, perhaps even a time-dependent wind, and perhaps I could even make the... Um, the, the convection time dependent by varying the, um, so if I add just the wind, for instance, uh, I still have the zero flux constraint. If you force the system with wind, the zero flux constraint doesn't change. However, uh, when I form the power integral here, I would have an extra term in the balance, which is due to the wind, a, a tau dot u term from the surface. 
But um, <coughs> so there's no way, no easy way to bound tau dot u. You can't get a handle on the rate of working of the force very easily. But the argument that I used to, uh, to make this deduction is still true. So, and this is observed numerically, if you add wind stress to the system, uh, the production of energy by convection is as weak as it ever was. It's just additive. And it's still constrained by the zero flux constraint, which follows just from the no flux boundary condition at the bottom. I'm, um, okay, in the real ocean, there's geothermal flux, it, which we could come to in a second. Um, but for this, but if you... Very small, yeah, so... The ones that right, well, okay, but then that's what horizontal convection, that's exactly this argument, right? Yes, 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 yes. There's a lateral flux stuff, so heat... How do you say that it is zero? Well, heat is going in here and coming out there, and in statistical steady state, the integral is zero. There's nothing coming in at the bottom. So whatever go is coming in at one part of the top is going out at another part of the top. And the integral through the top is zero in, st in steady state. And I even proved it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. There's heat going in and out, or buoyancy going in and out at the top, but the net flux through the surface has to be zero, right? Are you, are you happy, Michael? You're a happy camper? A sullen camper, okay. Okay, so now um, this conclusion, by the way, can be framed in a way which excites many people and makes them rather irritable. So, because it would imply that according to the zeroth law of turbulence, uh, horizontal convection, even in three dimensions, uh, can't possibly be turbulent. So the zeroth law of turbulence here, I'm quoting uh, from Uriel Frisch's nice book on the subject. If in an experiment on turbulent flow, uh, all pr control parameters are fixed, except for the viscosity, uh, which is lowered as much as possible the energy dissipation per unit mass approaches a non-zero limit. So in convection problems, um, we normally take this to mean take the viscosity to zero with the Prandtl number fixed, okay? So that's the limit I'm considering. Nu going to zero, kappa going to zero, but with the ratio fixed. So for water, the ratio is around seven. So the Prandtl number could be seven. I take nu to zero uh, with the Prandtl number fixed. And what we've shown is that the kinetic energy dissipation rate here is bounded by the molecular diffusivity. So if I take that limit, that means that the kinetic energy dissipation is going to zero linearly with the viscosity. The limit is non-singular, whereas uh, according to the zeroth law of turbulence, what should be happening is that the kinetic energy dissipation rate should be fixed because nu is going to zero uh, this squared gradient is going to infinity so that the product is independent of nu. That's the zeroth law of turbulence, that the limit is singular or that there's a dissipative anomaly. So the zeroth law of, tur we, th the zeroth law of turbulence defines turbulence by saying that the inviscid limit is singular. Uh, and this, I like this because um, this is a purely hydrodynamic definition of turbulence, which has nothing to do with what's been talked about in the rest of this meeting which is simply, you know, pathetic little unpredictability, difficulties with nonlinear um, divergence of initial conditions and so on and so forth. But for horizontal convection, the inviscid limit is not singular and therefore horizontal convection cannot be turbulent. And this, people hate this conclusion or a lot of people are disturbed by it. Now, why is this? It's, yeah. Yeah, uh, so what's, what's the difference there? Well, yeah, yeah, with, with, with Rayleigh Baynard convection, you've got a big fat flux of heat through the bottom of the box. And there's an unknown uh, flux. You don't know, you've prescribed the delta T, and you've got an unknown flux of buoyancy through the uh, container. Uh, 
Um, you can't prove, you can't bound epsilon. There's no direct bound on epsilon. At one surface. Yep. That makes sense. That's the that's a qualitative difference for the energetics. Oh, by the way, you mentioned Rayleigh Baynard convection. Um, so this is Scotty and White. Uh, we suggest the zeroth law is too restrictive, since according to this strict definition, uh, even canonical Rayleigh Baynard convection uh, would not be turbulent. So, well, okay. What, what they're saying is no one has ever been able to prove or show experimentally or numerically that Rayleigh Baynard convection satisfies the zeroth law. Okay. But it, it doesn't have a bound, and numerical and experimental attempts to see the, um, the zeroth law uh, can never get to a high enough Rayleigh number. That's always the excuse. It's just around the corner. Uh, if we could only increase the Rayleigh number by a factor of 100. Um, other people, let's see. Uh, horizontal convection can be interpreted in terms of a mechanical energy budget, but a detailed understanding has not emerged. Well, I would say these two little equations here and their exact identities um, encapsulate the mechanical energy balance, so what more is there to say? Um, these results explain why convection is much stronger than might be inferred from previous emphasis on minor terms the buoyancy flux viscous dissipation balance. Well, these are the minor terms. <laughs> uh, here's, people, here's another group um, who say horizontal convection is fully consistent with the zeroth law of turbulence. Thus, with our scaling theory, we have clarified the zeroth law of turbulence issue in horizontal convection. So if you read uh, what, these, what this group has done, they're considering the limit where nu goes to zero with kappa fixed. So in other words, the Prandtl number is going to um, zero. So it's like convection in liquid mercury. So it's not the same uh, limit that I'm considering, or which I think is relevant actually, uh, which is that you should take nu to zero with the Prandtl number fixed at a number like seven. I think what's going on here <coughs> is that uh, people aren't really interested in strict definitions. The definition which is being applied to turbulence is the same one that Justice Potter Stewart used in 1964 in explaining the legal uh, definition or threshold for obscenity. I know it when I see it, okay? So you've got people in the lab who are doing laboratory horizontal convection. You've got, the, the, this is done by the uh, group with, uh, by the Griffiths group at ANU. And this is a 3D uh, numerical solution obtained by um, Naveed Constantinou and Cesar Roca, uh, 3D DNS. This is the buoyancy surface, a single buoyancy surface in the flow. Um, and well, you look at this and you say, this should be called turbulence. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, five minutes? Do I have five minutes? No, I'm OK. Spiegel says uh, these uh, examples should be called thermalance rather than turbulence. OK. Um, well, I'm not going to have uh, time to finish this. So let me just uh, say a few things to wrap up here. Um, one response to all this, however, is to stop talking about epsilon, the mechanical energy dissipation rate, and instead talk about heat flux, um, which is measured by something called the Nusselt number, which is the ratio of uh, kappa grad B squared to the kappa grad B squared that you would obtain um, if there was no motion, if you just relied on molecular diffusion to transport the buoyancy. So that ratio is a non-dimensional number, which is a measure of how much heat is being transported. Uh, this is not quite obvious. I mean, what does this have to do with horizontal transport of buoyancy? There's no vertical transport of buoyancy, but there is a horizontal transport of buoyancy from the hot part to the cold part. And then the issue comes down to um, what is the dependence of the Nusselt number on the Rayleigh number? There's an exponent here, uh, and much of our attention has been focused on this exponent. Now, there are two different um, 
limits. There's actually a rigorous bound obtained with variational analysis, which says that the Nusselt number has to be less than Rayleigh number to the one third, or that chi, chi being kappa grad b squared, which is a measure of the irreversible mixing of the buoyancy field, uh, depends on the external parameters like this, where c is a dimensionless number. Um, so again, you'll notice that if I take kappa and nu to zero with the ratio kappa on nu fixed, uh, this says that chi is less than kappa to the one third. So again, the heat transport uh, is bounded from above by a power of the molecular diffusivity. So in other words, the heat transport is also very weak. There's also viscodiffusive scaling arguments uh, which indicate an even stronger dependence on kappa which, would, which say that the Nusselt number is Rayleigh number to the one-fifth. So an interesting mathematical issue uh, for mathematicians are looking for an interesting problem to work on. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to somehow narrow the gap between one-third and one-fifth um, and get an exponent here which is less than one-third if possible. Okay. What does it take? To get, uh, by the way, one fifth is closer to what's seen in most numerical solutions of the problem. Yeah. Quite a gap, actually, a quantitative gap between this variational bound and this scaling argument, which goes back to Rossby in 1967. Okay, I'm going to skip all the um, numerical results and just conclude. Uh, I'll let you read the uh, conclusions. You don't even have to do that if you've been paying attention. Thank you. Yes, in 3D turbulence, uh, the dissipation anomaly comes from a very big gradient uh, of velocity being built. Uh, actually, they, they become infinity in the limit of uh, viscosity tends to zero. So what you say is that in horizontal convection, you never see any sharp gradient of uh, buoyancy. You, d you don't have a very thin structure. If, you, if I look at the buoyancy field, is that... I mean, th this, is, this is inferred, but what you say? Well, if you just look, you see things that look, this is, this is the Justice Potter-Stewart definition. Uh, this, here's a buoyancy surface, and um, it certainly looks convoluted and complicated and uh, all of those good things. But as you take the limit, um, kappa grad B squared uh, can't be any bigger than kappa to the one third. That's a okay. It's, it's, yeah. it's just a, <laughs> I'm, I'm just surprised. <laughs> becomes very, very becomes smaller, faster than the gradients. That's what's happening. So you do get f f filamentation. So th the things go on very small scale in the momentum, in the velocity, but its amplitude becomes smaller and smaller and smaller as you make kappa becoming smaller with the Prandtl number fixed. That's what kills you. But the, even though the gradients become very... No, 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 so, so it's, uh, you, cannot, you cannot be gradient and uh, don't be velocity. Yeah, let me, let me, let me talk about this because this is kind of interesting. It's the difference between non-dimensional and dimensional. So suppose you're uh, an astrophysicist on Alpha Centauri looking at the Earth's oceans and uh, or looking at the horizontal convection problem and um, you say to yourself, um, I don't think that the molecular parameters nu and kappa can be important in this problem. So if I want to work out how big the velocities are, there's only one way to do it. I take the observed uh, delta buoyancy at the surface, which I can see, and I divide it by the depth, and I take 
uh, I divide it by, the, I want to get something with the dimensions of velocity. I multiply buoyancy by h and I take the square root, the square root of gh. That's a, a mechanical um, velocity scale. Now, when we do horizontal convection and we measure, uh, and we take, we measure the velocity in those units and we take the Rayleigh number to infinity, uh, the velocity goes to zero. It gets smaller and smaller. At the same time, the Reynolds number um, can become infinite, or at least the, uh, yeah, because that rely, I mean, it depends how you, what you use for the, no, well, there's a, there's a one on new in the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number becomes infinite, even though the velocity in mechanical units is going to zero. It doesn't go to zero as fast as the viscosity goes to zero. So the Reynolds number goes to infinity. But you never satisfy the strict definition of a dissipative anomaly. Yeah. Uh, the theorem holds when the heating is on the top side of your boat. Sorry? The, the theorem works when the heating is on the top side yes. of your boat. Yes. If the heating was on the left and the right, there's no such theorem. No such theorem, that's right. I bend it uh, into a sphere? Yeah, that is very helpful. Oh. Which looks kind of in between the... Oh, I think you can prove it. No, if, if the only heating is on the uh, external spherical surface, or even on the... If you have one spherical surface which has no flux, then I think the theorem works perfectly well. What, what you need is, is a, is a no-flux surface. So that means there's no flux between any, any spherical surface. It's the zero flux constraint that's the... Oh, and, and the direction of gravity, yeah. So let's thank the speaker and we see us all upstairs.